things work, we have trouble. We're going to do a drawing unit in art class. That makes sense to me. I thought, okay, that will be a good thing. Help you guys with your drawing a little bit. And then the other night, I heard a couple of adults talking. And they were saying things like, I have no talent in art. I wasn't born with any drawing ability, can't draw a straight line. Uh oh. If drawing ability is all talent that you're born with or you're not born with, a drawing unit is just a waste of our time. The people born with the talent for drawing will do well, the other people are doomed. It's a failure. It's something to think about, isn't it? I don't think it's true. But I think we should talk about it before we even start a drawing unit. So I offer this as evidence that it's not true. This is a part of a letter that was written over a hundred years ago by somebody to his brother. I would like a volunteer to read this aloud for us. It's a little difficult because it was written over a hundred years ago. Before you volunteer, I'm going to tell you this. Whoever volunteers, I'm going to have you move up to table number four so you're closer to the microphone. Are you willing to do that? All right, come on up. Just like a back seat right there would be fine, I think. Just speak clearly. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Okay. At the time when you spoke of becoming a painter, I thought it very impractical and would not feel of it. What made me stop doubting was reading a clear book on perspective, passages, on guide to the ABC of drawing. And a week later, I drew the interior of a kitchen with stove, chair, table, and window. In their places and on their legs, where areas before it had seemed to me that getting depth and right perspective into a drawing was witchcraft or pure chance. Thank you very much. Nice job. That's difficult to read because it was written so long ago that it's not the way we speak today. But here's the thing. You can read that and get no meaning from it. How many people feel they didn't get much meaning from that? We read it and don't really understand too much of it. Probably all of us. Well, not, not me because I've read it before. But yeah. So let's break it down, because I think it's that important. I mean, this is my evidence, so I, I want you to understand it. At the time when you spoke of my becoming a painter, I thought it very impractical and would not hear of it. It's not what we speak today, at least not often. I mean, you don't hear people in the lunch line saying things like, at the time when you spoke of my purchasing a cookie, I thought it very impractical and would not hear of it. But what are they saying? This one's not too hard. Who can kind of just translate this down to make it a little simpler? At the time you spoke of becoming a painter, I thought it very practical and would not hear of it. What are they saying? It's not hard. It's not tricky. I just need a volunteer. All right, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, I mean, kind of that. It's just kind of saying, you thought I could become, when you said I could become a painter, I didn't really think that was a good idea. And it's, it's as simple as that. We break it down, right? You said I could become a painter, I, I didn't think it was a good idea. What made me stop doubting was reading a clear book on perspective, and I don't know if it's Kassanji's or Kassanji's, I don't know. Guide to the ABC of drawing. I get that. Okay. He stopped doubting after he read this book. And a week later, I drew the interior of a kitchen. I get that too, the inside of a kitchen. With stove, chair, table, and window. I get that. So there was a stove, a chair, a table, and a window inside the kitchen. He made a picture of it. But here's the tricky part. What is he talking about when he says, in their places and on their legs. What is that? Like exactly where they were when you first built. Nice. He described it, um, but like the picture of it. Yes. 
some good stuff, yeah? All right, those are good answers. In their places and on their legs. I think, I don't think either one of you are wrong. You got more? Go ahead. Have you ever made a picture? It might not have been a kitchen, but some kind of like picture of the inside of a room. When you got done, some things just, they look askew. They look like maybe they were floating or not quite touching the floor or something. What he's saying is this. For the first time ever, he made a picture. It just happened to be a kitchen with a stove, chair, table, and window. But when he says in their places and on their legs, what he means is it looked right. When you look at the picture, things looked right. It looked like the, 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 the legs of the chair were touching the floor and the table was in the right place. For the first time ever, it looked right. That's why he stopped doubting. A week after reading that book, he was able to make a picture that looked right, and it was the first time he thought maybe he could become an artist. Whereas before, it had seemed to me that getting depth and the right perspective into a drawing was witchcraft or pure chance. What's he saying there? It was so hard that when he saw, well, let me ask you this. Let me back up. Has anybody here ever seen an artwork, a drawing, a painting? that somebody else did, and it is so good that not only do you know you couldn't have made it, but you can't even figure out how the person who did make it could do it. And if you're not raising your hand right now, you're going to, because watch this. You ever see this, the chalk guy, Julian Beaver? This guy's amazing. This is a photograph. That is Julian Beaver standing on like a sidewalk. This is not a Coke bottle. It is a drawing in chalk that is flat on the ground. It is flat on the ground. But he drew it in such a way that it looks three-dimensional. It's like he's got magic powers, isn't it? So he's got, that's what he's saying. He is saying right here, before getting depth and the right perspective into the drawing was witchcraft. So it's like the people had a magic power, or they just plain got lucky, that they just happened to throw a bunch of lines down and it worked. Well, let me ask you this. If we had to put this guy into a category born with talent for drawing, or B, working on trying to improve his art skills, which category would he go in? It's pretty simple. Which category? Yeah, B. He's working, he's reading a book, he finally, you know, at first he doesn't even think he can become an artist. Well, it's interesting, because this was written by a person to his brother, Theo. And Theo thought this guy should try to become an artist. At first he didn't think he should. Right in this letter he said that. Theo tried to help out his brother. Well, you know what, let's just go, let me show you this. You, you know this, you've heard of this guy. You might not know much about him, but you've heard of him. Vincent Van Gogh wrote that. Now he's considered one of the world's great artists. There was a point he didn't even think he could become a painter at all. So I don't think it's true it's all talent. Vincent Van Gogh worked very hard to try to improve his art skills. Um, here's what happened. Vincent Van Gogh had a hard life. Things did not go well for him. He worked in a bookstore for a while, got fired. He worked as a preacher, that didn't work out. He had several jobs that didn't work out. And finally, he's poor, he doesn't have a job. His younger brother, Theo, says to him, I think you should be an artist. And not only that, Theo thinks that, because he wants to help his brother out, Theo starts sending him money. Sends him a little money to pay some rent, buy a little food, get some art supplies, buy a book once in a while. And the plan was this. Theo would support him for a while until Vincent got good enough to start selling his paintings. And then Vincent would pay Theo back once he started selling his work. That was the plan. And in the 1880s, folks, there's no texting. Not even cell phones. There's not even phones. 
There's no internet, no computers. And so their communication was letters, and they wrote hundreds of letters to each other. You know, because Vincent was telling Theo about all things he was trying to do for his drawing skills, his ideas, what he could do to start selling some paintings, and Theo was sending him, you know, money. And the weird thing is they kept all their letters. And so there's even a website today you can go and read all of these communications. It's fun to do. Well, if you're an art teacher, it's fun to do. I don't know if you enjoy reading them all, but I, I, and I haven't read all of them. But I like going through and reading them. Vincent Van Gogh's story is pretty interesting, too. Here's one of his very first paintings. Well, I shouldn't say that. It's the first painting he was sure was going to be considered a masterpiece. He was sure this was going to sell for a whole lot of money, and he was going to be able to start um, paying Theo back. He writes in bunches of letters, he writes about this. He planned this out for months. The composition, when I say the composition, does anybody know what I mean? In art, what does composition mean? If you compose a piece of music, anybody? The composition means just where everything is going to be, the place where the people are going to be, where the light's going to be, what it's going to look like in the background. He planned the composition out for months. He sent little sketches in his letters to his brother. And he spent a long time painting this. And when he got done, nobody wanted it. People didn't think it was great. He thought it looked like a photograph. He thought he painted it just realistically. But I don't think he was quite there yet. I think he was still working on his art skills. Look at the faces. Do they look like photographic faces to you? They kind of, to me, they're a little cartoon, isn't it? It's like they're exaggerated a little bit. And I don't think that was on purpose. I just think that's where his skills were at the time. Look at the colors. Are these happy, bright, cheerful colors? No. Because here's what this painting was about. All of his early paintings, he made this decision. Remember I told you he worked as a preacher for a while? The people that he helped when he was a preacher were incredibly poor folks. And so in his art, his first idea was he was going to share how hard these, the lives of these poor people were. So his paintings were all about how difficult their lives were. And this one is called The Potato Eater, 1885, because all these folks have for dinner are a few potatoes. And it looks like a little coffee. That's, that's their supper. So he's showing that. That's all they have to eat. Their house is not very fancy. Their clothes are not very fancy. He was trying to show how hard their lives were. But people did not think that it was good, and people were not interested in purchasing it. 1888, that's a self-portrait. That's a portrait he made of himself, because that's what a self-portrait is. And I knew that already. But he discovered some Japanese woodcuts. And they have very bright colors. Now, when I say woodcut, does anybody know what that is? You know what a print is? Yeah, me in sixth grade, you should know. We did a print project, or at least one of the quarters we did. Remember taking a piece of styrofoam? We pressed into it, and then we put ink on it and pressed the paper on That's a print. A print is where you make multiple copies of it. A woodcut is a print using a wood block. You actually take a flat piece of wood, and then you've got special sharp knives where you carve into the wood. And that creates high areas and low areas. And then you take a brayer, it's like a paint roller, and you put ink on it. The ink only hits the high areas. You put your piece of paper on there, you pull it away, you've got your print, and you can do that multiple times. And you can put different colors on there, too. So these Japanese prints had beautiful bright colors. And for whatever reason, Vincent Van Gogh was affected by that, and he changed his paintings. And he started using incredibly bright colors. Not so much this self-portrait, but take a look at this thing. You might have seen this one before. Anybody ever see this painting? It's a bedroom in Arles. Vincent Van Gogh. Here's the thing. When Vincent Van Gogh decided to become an artist, he was passionate about it. You don't see anything in these letters where he says, oh, I took a week off to go camping. Yeah, that would be hard on me. I, I love going camping. Remember, he doesn't go fishing. He just paints. And, what it, and he liked to paint outdoors. He liked to take all this stuff outdoors and actually paint scenes in the outdoors. But when it rained, he still wanted to paint. So there's actually several paintings when he lived in Arles of his bedroom. Look at that painting. 1888. Do you think Vincent 
bedroom was truly that bright blue, almost like electric blue. I don't think so either. And people didn't like his paintings. And one of the things they said about them were this, that his colors were, I don't know what it was, like extravagant, that they weren't real, that they were like hyper right? And And probably so. People didn't like it. Super bright. Anybody seen this painting before? Goodness, I hope so. This is probably Vincent's most famous painting. This might even be, no, it is. I would say this is one of the most famous paintings in the world. I don't know if we can say that one painting is the most famous one, but this is certainly one of the most famous paintings in the world. It's called The Starry Night, 1889, Vincent painted this. Now, people didn't like it. Take a good look at that painting. Does it remind you of a photograph? No. Have any of you had the luxury, the privilege, of being able to go on some kind of camp out in like northern Wisconsin or upper Michigan or Canada, and you've been able to stay up after the stars came out on a clear night and see the stars? I have. I love how hot. It's completely different than what it looks like here. Do you go out in your yard at night and look up at You see a few stars, but we have so much light pollution today. And so many street lights and, you know, Walmart parking lots and Rim Mountain lit up at night that it pollutes our light or our sky. And the stars are very, very dim and you don't see very much. If you can get up by Lake Superior or Canada, oh my gosh, it's completely different. And of course, in Vincent's time, they didn't really even have much for electric light. So there was no light pollution then. No matter where you were, the stars would have been beautiful. So he's sitting up on this hillside. He actually went outside and painted it. Then. Took his stuff out and painted it at night. We don't know. We do not know if this one was painted on site or just as his imagination. Don't know. But there definitely were paintings he did at night. But look at that sky. Look, look at this. What is going on up here, folks? I mean, if you and I were going to paint the starry night, we would probably get out some black paint, paint the whole sky in black, let it dry. Then get out a nice detailed brush, get some white paint, start putting little dots of white on it. Wouldn't that make sense? It's like, is that how we do it, wouldn't it? No. It's not what Vincent did. What's he done? I mean, any, what is this? What is that? Okay. You're a good mom. Go ahead. Okay. That's what I think. Yeah. All right. Can you see the wind? No. no. When I go out with my camera, I love photography. But I can't photograph the wind. Maybe if I get lucky, you know, and the wind's blowing some leaves, I could get a photograph with the leaves in the air or something. But it's pretty hard to do. So Vincent Van Gogh, he's putting all these swirly lines and stuff in here. So here's, here's what I think. I don't think Vincent Van Gogh is trying to make a painting of what it looked like that night. I mean, you'd think art would just be about what things look like. I don't think that's what his goal was. I, was I think he's trying to show us something a whole lot harder than what it looks like. Any ideas? This is a deep thought question. Probably you're not going to figure this one out, but maybe. What might he have been doing here? If he wasn't trying to show us what it looked like, what could he be trying to show us? Well, that's possible. That's not the answer I was thinking of, but that's a good answer. The wind? Yeah, and you can't see the wind, but what can you do? I mean, what you can... I think what Vincent Van Gogh is trying to do is this. You're up on this hillside all alone. There's a few people still awake in the village, but most people are asleep. The stars are twinkling. The wind's coming by. He's trying to show you what it felt like, not just what it looked like. If you've been lucky enough to see those stars in you know, northern Wisconsin, upper Michigan, you know what? They're not a solid little dot in the sky. Anybody ever notice how they like get brighter and dimmer and seem to twinkle? And the wind? Yeah. Hey, 
I think that's what this stuff's about right here. I think he's trying to show you that the stars are twinkling and shimmering and getting brighter and dimmer. And how do you do it in the painting? Well, this was his solution. You know, he's painted all of these little dots and stuff to give you those ideas and a textured sky. And he's trying to show you the winds come in this tree or this shrub. It's supposed to be like a cypress tree. He's painted it to kind of show you that it's swaying in the wind. To me, he's pretty successful. When I look at this painting, I honestly can kind of get those feelings of that starry night. And the, the stars seem like they're twinkling. And I, I just know the wind's blowing. I can almost hear the wind when I look at this painting. That's what makes him a great artist, you know. Looking to make things look right is one thing. That's what we're going to try to do. But to take it to the next level and actually put feelings into an artwork, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. You know, when I was your age, I loved this painting. And for years, this is, this is what I saw this painting. But this is a picture somebody took. You know, they went to the museum, took a camera, took a picture. It's so much better if you can actually see the real painting. I never have. This one's over in Europe someplace. I don't know where. We can look it up. But it's in the museum. It's kept safe. Have you ever heard of Google Art Project? Yeah. Yeah, not many people have. Google Art Project. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click on this, and hopefully all this technology is going to work, and we're going to take a link right to Google Art Project. Yeah, I'm a technology wizard, people. Did you see? Not, not really, but this works. So this is Google Art Project. That doesn't look a lot different than what we just looked at earlier. They go in with cameras, and they go to the real paintings, and they take pictures. But here's the thing. Their cameras are super high-definition, multi-megapixel, fantastic cameras. So we can do this. And before we do it, let me tell you something about this Van Gogh's painting that people said. One of the things they said about his painting that they didn't like was this. Most artists during those times, they would have a palette. A palette's a place you mix your colors. And they would take their colors, and they would carefully blend and mix their colors until they had just the perfect color. And then they would take their brush, and they would carefully and slowly apply it to their painting. That's not what Vincent Van Gogh did. In fact, they accused him of not mixing his colors on a palette at all. They said, he just squeezes his paint right out of the tube onto his brush and slaps it on his canvas. Well, let's see if that's true. Because with Google Art Project, look what we can do. We can zoom in closer and closer and closer to the artwork. This is pretty neat. This is something I could never do when I was your age. I never got to see this. Give it a second, it'll get really clear. That's so neat. Hey, what is this? What is this pattern here? Any ideas what we're looking at? What do you think that is? The canvas. Yeah, that's the canvas. Because see, when they made paintings, you know, and people still do this, you, know, you can get boards to paint on, but most of you would buy canvas cloth, you'd make a frame out of wood, you'd stretch it tight around the frame, and that's what you painted on. Vincent Van Gogh, is painting so furiously fast when he does the starry night, he doesn't even cover up the whole canvas. In all kinds of places, you can actually see the canvas. And remember what I said to them about the thing he didn't mix his paints well before he put it on? This is one brush stroke, you can tell, right? Is it one color? No, there's like three different colors or more. You know, there's white on this side of the brush, and then this bluish gray changes and you can just see that he just put it on here. Look at this brush stroke. There's multiple colors in here too. When you get this close, you can just feel that he was just like furiously applying the paint. At least I think so. Maybe you agree, maybe you don't think so, but it sure looks like it. It looks like he just put that paint on. He was just painting really quickly. There's places where the paint has like dried like little waves. It's so thick. He didn't even take the time to like flatten it out on the picture. I don't know if I can find one or not. I'll look around here. But I have found ones where they're actually curled like little miniature ocean waves. And then the paint just dried. Well, well kind of right here. You can kind of see it, right? That was so thick that it's three-dimensional. And then it just dried like a, like a wave on here because he put the paint on so thick. So when you look close at this thing, I think we can see where some of the... Oh, here. This is a perfect one. Look at this. Let me let, wait till that thing gets clear. You're going to see that. The paint was so thick 
Look at it. It curled over like a wave in the ocean and then just hardened. So people thought, that's not good art. That is not good art because he did not, you know, he didn't put his time in. But when you back out from this thing and you look at it as a whole painting, it's like, wow. There we go. So it's interesting. People did not care for his artwork at the time, and but now we do. We consider him one of the world's great artists. 1889. This is his postman. Theo and Vincent sent so many letters back and forth that the postman ended up becoming friends of Vincent, and he came back to post for portraits because Vincent wanted to practice all the time, so he would take any volunteer he could. He did post portraits of the postman. The postman eventually brought his wife and kids, and Theo painted them too. Or not Theo, I'm sorry, Vincent painted them too. Here's another idea he had. He thought, he wrote to Theo about this. He thought, I'll bring some sunflowers into my studio, and then it doesn't matter if it's raining or not, I can make smaller pictures pretty fast. He made a whole series of sunflower pictures. He thought he could start selling these. People would like these for decorating their house, and people did. They didn't want that either. That doesn't make you feel like a hot summer day. You know, I, it just feels like 100 degrees because it reminds me of summertime, which is kind of a nice thing to take, actually. All right, if you bring up the words Vincent van Gogh, most adults will say, oh, yeah, and they got one fact. They probably can't even tell you a single painting he made, but they'll tell you about this. 1889, self-portrait with bandaged ear. What's going on here? Anybody? Anybody know? I'm going to look for a different volunteer because you, you've got a lot of great answers, but I want to get some other people involved here. I've got my one volunteer, people. Come on, step up. I know you guys know this. You've heard this. Cut off part of his ear. Yeah. It's true. I took a whole class just on Vincent Van Gogh, and it really did happen. People remember it because as humans, we like to make sense of things, right? We want to say to ourselves, oh, you know what? If this happened to me, I'd cut off part of my ear, too. And can you think of anything where it would make sense to cut off part of your ear? No. No, we can't, because it doesn't make sense. Most people say stuff, he cut off his whole ear and mailed it to his girlfriend. That's what people say. No. That's not true. That's not really what happened. I actually studied this, read books, and so I think I've got a better handle on what actually took place. First off, I'm going to tell you that it doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense because, A, most people believe Vincent Van Gogh was suffering from some mental health issues at a time when there wasn't a lot of help. B, Vincent Van Gogh did not take care of himself. When Theo sent them money, it wasn't much. And if Vincent had the choice between buying some more paint or buying some food, he would buy more paint. He went three days at a time without eating. So imagine what kind of shape you'd be, you know, your mental state going without food for days at a time, off going without food for days at a time. Um, so here's what happens. Vincent van Gogh had this idea. And truthfully, it sounds like a pretty good idea. He lives in the 1880s when there's no internet. Photography is just barely going. The only way you could see other artists work was to wait for them to finish paintings, put them in a gallery, and you had to travel to the gallery to see them. So his idea was this. He thought, what if I get a big house and invite some of the best artists of the time to all live there together, like an art commune. We'll all live there. And then, you know, you're a great artist, and you would start painting, and you're a great artist, but you could walk over and learn some stuff from him, you know, and you could walk over and, and learn some stuff from this great artist, and just think how much better everyone would get more quickly. That actually makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? It does. So he actually does it. Even though he's got barely any money, he finds a house, and he sends out invitations. Now, you're a great artist. You've been selling your work for a lot of money. People look at highly regarded, and you just get a letter from some guy named Vincent Van Gogh who doesn't even mix his colors on the house. He just slaps them up there. He wants you to go live with him and learn art. Are you going to go? You're a great artist.
but you're not going either, are you? I mean, you're selling your work. This guy doesn't even sell painting. It doesn't make any sense. Only one person comes. The guy's name's Paul Gauguin, and he's not very famous. Although later on, he does become a great artist, too. Paul Gauguin is uh, considered a great artist. So Paul Gauguin moves in, and he finds out something about Vincent van Gogh. He's not easy to get along with. His moods go from really happy to incredibly angry, screaming mad really quickly. In fact, it's so bad that Paul Gauguin quickly realizes he wants nothing to do with this and he's leaving. And it's so bad that he doesn't even want to tell Vincent he's leaving because he's afraid Vincent van Gogh's going to fly off the handle in some kind of rage. So Vincent van Gogh goes into town to run an errand. Paul Gauguin grabs his stuff and just gets out of there. Vincent comes back. His dream has been shattered. The only person who came has now left. And apparently Paul Gauguin was right because Vincent went into a rage of anger. And you're in seventh grade. I think I can tell you this. There was alcoholic beverages involved. He drank and got drunk. And then he was in a rage and drunk. And that night he took his razor that you would use for shaving. And you know, the, back then they just had a straight razor. You know, it wasn't like a razor like people use today. It was just a blade. Chopped off part of his ear with his razor. And then he wandered around showing it to people. Because he was drunk. Yeah. It's a true story. But he wakes up the next day, and just like you and I, you know, we want to make sense out of things. Vincent Van Gogh can't make sense out of it either. In his letter to his brother, he writes about how he's embarrassed, he's ashamed, he doesn't know why it happened, he's bewildered, he's worried if he did that, will he do more things? Look at the expression in his eyes. He's such a great artist. He captured his own expression. It looks like, I call it, it looks like a 500 mile stare. It's not like he's looking at anything. It's like he's looking inside himself. And I think he probably was. Because in his letters, he can just, he doesn't know. He's trying to understand his own behavior. And things got worse, you know. He, his, he didn't even trust himself. Back in those days, if you had mental health issues that were severe enough that they thought you could pose a danger to yourself or others, they would put you in an asylum. You couldn't leave. You were trapped there. He actually asked to go there because he didn't know what was going on with himself. This painting was done there. Take a look at it. To me, I get the feeling that it's not a very pleasant place to be. Some seventh graders have disagreed with me. They feel by looking at the painting it looks like a cheerful, fun place to be. I'd like to get your impressions. What do you think of the painting? What feelings do you think he's trying to share with you, the viewer of the asylum? Go ahead, volunteer, all that volunteer of all lives. Yes. Creepy. So you get a creepy feeling from it. And yes. Yeah, I don't know if the carpets are ripped, it kind of looks like it. Because it looks like you're seeing bricks. Yeah. All right. All good answers. Somebody the other day shared a little bit that I thought was amazing. Let me just tell you what he said. He said that when he looked at this, he got the feeling that it was a fake happy place. Like they tried to paint it up to be happy. But Vincent's showing you that underneath. You know? And I think maybe he's right. Maybe that's why there's these greens. Because the orange is a happy color. But then look how he puts these greens hidden in here, kind of. And the other one somebody said was, it looked like the way out was so far away you could never get there. Another pretty good impression. I think mean, that might be what Vincent's trying to show us. It's like once you're in the asylum, the way out is so far away, it's like you, you can't get out. I don't know. Here's a few other paintings of Vincent's, just to show you some other work of his. 1890. Now, there's something else I want to show you. Do you guys know of a singer named Don McLean? Anybody know any songs by Don McLean? You probably don't. His most famous song was in the 1970s, which I'm guessing you you probably weren't around in the 1970s. I was. It was good times. Yeah, Vincent Van Gogh was an interest to Don McLean. I can't get this to work. I tried to embed one show in the other one, but we'll go just jump here. I can bring it up here. So anyway, Don McLean, he's got a song you do know. You've heard this song because it's, it's one of the most famous. It's like a top ten rock song of all time. Did you ever hear the song? It goes like this. I'm not going to sing it, but I'll just say the words. Bye-bye, Miss American Pie. 
Drove my Chevy to the levee, but the levee was dry. You ever hear that song? Yeah. Don McLean wrote that. That song has got nothing to do with this, but Don McLean wrote the song I'm about to share with you also. Um, that song, by the way, is about a plane crash. And it's a plane crash where some of the best musicians of the day, like three or four of them all perished in one plane crash. That's what the American Pie song is based on loosely. But Don McLean studied Vincent Van Gogh's life, and he was so moved by Vincent Van Gogh's struggles and that people didn't understand his artwork while he was alive that he wrote a song. And it became a top 10 song on the radio, but people didn't really know it was about Vincent Van Gogh. Most people didn't know. It's called The Starry Night, and the word, and Vincent's in there, but most people just thought it was about somebody named Vincent. They didn't understand it. But somebody took Don McLean's song, and then they put a bunch of Vincent Van Gogh's artwork to it. It's pretty neat. I want you to just sit back and, and listen to the song and then look at some of the artwork. You're going to see some of the ones you've already seen. You're going to see a bunch more of the early stuff, though, where it was really dark colors and sad stuff. Starry, starry night. Paint up with blue and gray. Look out on the Frameless heads on nameless walls 
With eyes that watch the world and can't forget Like the strangers that you met The ragged men in ragged clothes A silver thorn, a bloody rose I crushed and broken on the virgin snow Now I think I know We're not listening, they're not listening. Perhaps they.